Pneumatic valves contain a lot of special materials and engineering. The purpose of this presentation is to teach you about the materials that go into the valves, specifically metals, elastomer materials or rubber materials, and some of the coatings that go on our valves. First, metals. To select a metal for a valve, you have to understand its strength, and the strength of a valve consists of three parts. The tensile strength is actually how much force a section of the material can withstand before it fractures. The yield strength is how much stress you can apply to the material before it starts permanently deforming. And finally, elongation is how much did it stretch before it fractured. You could imagine that a rubber band can stretch almost six times its length before it will break, but iron maybe only 10%. Another parameter of the material that we use is called the hardness. It's a measure of the material to resist an indentation, and it's directly related to its strength. If the hardnesses of two metals that are pressed together are similar, they may cause galling. Galling is almost like welding of two metals together. It's very common when you're inserting a stainless steel bolt into a stainless steel valve cover. The friction associated with inserting threads together like that can produce very high forces and galling. It's almost like the parts are welded together. So it's very important to have different hardnesses between nuts and bolts and between valve seats and valve bodies. Some of the structural materials we use for our valve bodies are gray iron, ductile iron, cast steel, and when corrosion resistance is needed, cast stainless steel. Casting metal is an interesting process. We have a pattern or a mold where liquid metal is poured in, into the cavity produced by that mold in the sand. And what's interesting is when the metal solidifies, it solidifies at a different rate. You can see gray iron solidifies or shrinks about one eighth inch per foot, whereas cast steel shrinks about a quarter inch per foot. This means we need a different set of patterns or molds to make our valves at the various foundries if the materials are different. What is an alloy? An alloy is a mixture of certain elements together that are melted together and kind of are based on a recipe. This is the recipe for type 304 stainless steel, which is typically what your silverware is made at home. And you can see that the first element on the periodic table used in the recipe is 71% iron. The second one is 18% chromium and then 8% nickel, etc., etc. Gray iron is an interesting structural material because it is very strong, but it is brittle. It's brittle because its microstructure consists of graphite flakes, as shown in the picture. Back in the 1950s, somebody invented ductile iron, which basically is gray iron treated with magnesium right before it gets poured into the, into the molds. It has a higher strength than gray iron, and because the magnesium was added to the mix, the graphite flakes turned into graphite nodules, which makes the valve almost, or makes the material seem almost like steel. For the trim materials like shafts and seats and things, we always use a corrosion resistant material. Stain, types of stainless steel. Nitronic 60 is a very specialized stainless steel to prevent galling. Our silent check valves have lead-free bronze called silicone bronze. And when we need higher strength, we use a bronze material called aluminum bronze. The selection of these materials is very important because of something called galvanic action. Imagine you had a battery set up, and when you pick an anode and a cathode material, there's an interaction on the molecular level where the electrons from one material are sacrificed toward the, toward the other material. So therefore, it's important on when you're building a valve that the very small parts or the trim parts 
are way down on the cathodic end of that scale, such as stainless steel, and the big heavy parts, like the iron, are up on the top part. Many years ago, we were mandated by the EPA to take the lead out of our valves to provide safe drinking water. Traditionally, our bronze material was valve bronze called C836, which had 5% lead in it. Some of our non-wetted parts are, have 7% lead for bearing materials because lead is a good bearing material. But we have since changed to silicon bronze, which has almost 0% lead and our aluminum bronzes also have 0% lead. So all of our check valves about 10 years ago were changed to lead-free valves. We have a device in our quality department called an XRF gun. This is an X-ray fluorescence machine. It's a very expensive machine and it sends a X-ray through the metal and then reads out what the chemistry of that metal is. Therefore, we can take a shot of any piece of metal in the factory and know whether it's stainless steel, steel, or even what grade of stainless steel that it is. We're going to transition now and talk a little about rubber materials called elastomers. An elastomer is a polymer. It has a, mole a molecule such as the one shown, and that little N indicates that there's a chain of these that could be thousands long which gives it its elastomeric properties. One property we check all the time is its hardness or durometer. Now, this scale was invented by a man named Shore 100 years ago, and it, it measures the hardness of the rubber on a scale of 0 to 100, where valve seats range usually between 60 and 80 durometer. Elongation is important to know how well the material can stretch before it breaks. We are also concerned about the chemical resistance of our elastomers because valves could be exposed by various disinfectants like chlorine and such in the water and the rubber has to withstand that, that type of exposure. Rubber is made of a recipe. It's kind of a black art. That's why we have the witch shown there. It's a mixture of many different things, such as 100, points, 100 parts of elastomer, some plasticizers, carbon black, which gives it its color, and it'll have other ingredients which help cures the rubber. You mix all this stuff up, and then you cook it in the oven for 320 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes, not dissimilar from a pizza, and then you get resilient rubber. We use many different types of rubber. Probably the most popular is Buta N. It's got excellent resistance to petroleum products, so it's good for wastewater service, but not as good for outdoor exposure. But most of our valves are buried or inside of a pipeline. Another material we use is neoprene. It's very similar to Buta N uh, with resistance to petroleum products and oxygen. It also can be, it can be used outdoors. EPDM is a little more expensive material. It's got great resistance to some steam and chemicals and higher temperatures, and it's commonly used because of its resistance to chloramines, which is a disinfectant for drinking water. It's also used in the hoses for your car because of its resistance to a hot water and steam. Viton is a very expensive fluorocarbon elastomeric material known for its ability to withstand high temperatures. So it's therefore used in aircraft and auto applications where special resistance to fluids are needed. Natural rubber is the first rubber used to produce car tires and it comes from trees. These days though it's made by synthetic methods and it's still used in some of our valves like the swing flex is a rubber lining material because it provides great resistance to abrasion and wear from abrasive slurries in wastewater applications. Teflon is a white plastic or elastomer that can resist almost every kind of chemical and solvent. We use it as our seating material in our threaded silent check valve. 
and it's also a packing material in several ball valves. Nylon is a plastic material that's used to strengthen rubber. We can put it in our swing flex disc to give it some strength and tie the hinge pin to the flat metal plate inside of the disc. It's limited in temperature to about 210 degrees Fahrenheit, which means our swing flex check valve can be only used to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. A similar material to nylon is peak. Peak is used in our industrial ball valve because it's good to temperatures to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see that depending on the temperature of your application, it pretty much dictates what kind of elastomeric or plastic material you can use. Another consideration is the chemical resistance of the elastomer. We publish a chart of hundreds of chemicals versus all the various elastomers and plastics and metals that we put in our valves. And we show where it's compatible, which would be a rating of A, or where it's not recommended, which would be a rating of C. Let's talk a little bit about paint and coatings. First, to apply a good epoxy coating, you need to clean the body, and we use a, a blasting system that creates a near white metal finish, or it's 95% clean to remove all the rust and debris on the valve. After the valve is blasted, we apply some type of coating. One of the most common coatings we use is an acrylic primer, Valmatic Blue. This material is was changed about 20 years ago to a water or latex based material with low VOCs, which stands for volatile organic compounds, which are harmful to the environment. Another coating we use is a two part epoxy, where you do part A, part B, mix it together, and then over about 30 minutes, it sets up hard. It's a very durable coating for valves. The one Downfall of it is that it takes several days to set up so you cannot use the valve right away. The best coating is fusion bonded epoxy. We take a dry powder and affix it to the, a preheated valve at about 400 degrees Fahrenheit and the powder melts against the valve. Then we put the valve back in the oven and cure the coating fully and then the valve is ready for use. On the left is our coating facility where you could see the operator getting ready to apply the dry powder to the valve part. And on the right, the, the finished valve is being placed back in the oven to be fully cured. We have a YouTube video that explains the difference between a fusion bonded epoxy coating and a liquid epoxy coating. So look for that on your desktop and watch that video. After the coatings are complete, cooled, dried, and cured, we run tests on them. We can measure the thickness of the coating to make sure it is about 12 to 20 mils thick. A mil is uh, one one thousandth of an inch. We also want to make sure the coating has no gaps or pinholes. A pinhole is called a holiday. So we have a tester called a holiday tester, which uses low voltage or high voltage to detect any pinholes in the coating. We often take the valve, and I talked about rubber lining, a swing flex check valve, but here we also offer this green glass lining. Glass lining is necessary so that there's no buildup of materials on the inside of the valve as shown in these two pipes above. Struvite is a material or a waste product as part of a wastewater process which builds up in the pipe and prevents flow. If you glass line your valve, nothing sticks to it and the valve and pipe can stay clear. I hope you enjoyed our talk about valve materials and engineering today. Some of the key points I'd like to remind you is that ductile iron is certainly the best material over cast iron because it is not brittle. Elastomers are more of an art than a science and you can't beat Valmatic's fusion-bonded epoxy coating. Thank you for listening.